thank you so much for your time. It's uh, it's a strange thing to see you in civilian clothes, mate. Um, I know it's, it's a strange feeling. It's it's only been a few weeks, but um, I'm really struggling with this no uniform and having to work out what tie to wear with what shirt, or dare I say it, whether I even wear a tie at all. So a lot of adjustment personally, but but a pretty significant uh, undertaking and a lot of work to do. Yeah, a lot of work, and it's of course incredibly important work. What do you think the biggest challenges are in communications? In I'll, I'll focus primarily on recovery first of all. Oh, look, absolutely, and and I, I think the real challenge is um, first and foremost right now is the enormity, the scale, the complexity of the of the disasters and the events that have unfolded here in New South Wales over the last six to twelve months, and. And what I mean by that, while while the big focus is absolutely on the on, on the unprecedented bushfire damage and destruction and and devastation, we've got to be mindful that that's the bushfires came on the back of of extraordinary uh, widespread drought conditions across New South Wales. As a matter of fact, leading into the bushfires, 100% of the state of New South Wales was drought affected, drought declared, uh, have it causing major uh, challenges across rural and regional New South Wales. Uh, the bushfires then compounded that situation, uh, unprecedented damage and destruction from the from the Queensland border to the Victorian border. Um, uh, damage and destruction from the uh, from the bushfires alone, I think two billion dollars uh, was lost in tourism, agriculture, and, and retail income. Uh, there's another billion dollars expected to be uh, lost as a result of primary production. Uh, initial assessment of just the state-owned assets. Uh, was not shy of a billion dollars, or just shy of a billion dollars. It was about eight or nine hundred million dollars. Nearly two and a half thousand uh, homes were destroyed, uh, and of course, you've got all the other social implications, environment and wildlife, and and what have you, and the long-term impacts of of those sorts of things. And of course, um, on the back of the fires, we've seen uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic and all the implications and challenges associated with that, and particularly restrictions on movement and and, and limiting the spread, that also compounded the challenges of, of the recovery and rebuilding, and particularly uh, the stimulus that was expected with people visiting and spending in, in rural and regional areas. Uh, but there's also the extraordinary psychological and emotional uh, toll that's been occasioned. A lot of people experience absolute trauma. Uh, they've lost everything. They've lost livelihoods. They've lost their home. Uh, they've lost all sorts of um, uh, buildings and infrastructure and belongings. Um, and we should never forget that in New South Wales alone, uh, 26 lives have been lost or attributed to the fires, uh, including uh, three aerial firefighters uh, from America, uh, Ian Macbeth, Paul Hudson and Rick Morgan Jr. And of course, our three volunteers uh, who lost their life fighting the fires and uh, Jeff and Andrew and, uh, and Sam, um, a, a terribly tragic season all round. And whilst we saw the worst in in Mother Nature, while we've seen the worst of disasters and compounding effects of disasters, uh, we've seen absolutely uh, the very best in humanity, the very best in people, uh, but people have been absolutely traumatised and communi communicating uh, in, in, a, in a recovery sense uh, in many ways is, is very different to the response and, and operational effort because uh, you've got people that are traumatised in recovery, you've got people that have had time to reflect and start taking stock of of what they've lost, what they don't have, trying to contemplate uh, where to from here, what next, how am I going to get through, what is my next step, what assistance available to me, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and the, the, the Aussie culture is such that a lot of people don't want to put their hand up for help. They don't want to come forward and say, I'm doing it tough, I need assistance. Um, so getting to people that A, don't necessarily want to be contacted uh, is really challenging, but making sure we're using all the options available. So in New South Wales, we had a really good arrangement uh, with the Commonwealth, uh, the state agencies, local authorities, non-government organisations, trying to reach out and connect with uh, all manner of people uh, scattered over a very, very big geographic area of the state, all needing different levels of assistance, a variety of assistance and support, depending on their particular circumstances. So communicating and connecting has been challenging. But the principles of being honest and sharing what people need to know rather than what we think they want to hear, uh, but knowing that people care, knowing that there is support available and how we can best get that support out is really, really important. Yeah, I think um, 
honest and and reaching out and knowing what they need to hear and and what they want to hear is is hugely important of course um shane like yourself i started in the early days as a volunteer firefighter from the operations world and you now find yourself um shifting into a recovery world um how do you see the the difference in communications uh from operations response into recovery and do you think you're going to bring any different approaches to the communications aspects of the work in recovery i mean one of the things for example that i'd love to see would be a communica uh, sorry a recovery emergency operations center um you know we don't adopt things like the aim structures and things in recovery as much do you think you'll you'll bring those sort of that sort of thinking into the role yeah, we, 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 we will, and we are doing it in, in a different way, uh, Peter, but, but I think the overriding principle in, in whatever we're doing uh, is, a, is a sincerity and an authenticity around caring for people and what matters to people and recognising that everybody's situation uh, is different. Uh, and, and as I mentioned a little, little moment ago, <clears throat> we have established, uh, due to the scale of the, of, of the bushfires, the unprecedented nature of the bushfires called for for unprecedented or, or new ways of thinking and new ways of operation. And, and we have established in New South Wales a joint task force comprising uh, uh, federal government agencies, state government agencies, the ADF, uh, non-government partners, et cetera, et cetera. And, and from January, um, uh, the Recovery Operations Centre uh, has, has coordinated information and communication needs uh, from a state level and a Commonwealth level, working in partnership with our colleagues there, right out through to the locally led uh, local uh, recovery committees and people in the field interacting with people every day uh, at an individual level and at a community level uh, and understanding that that information flow is not just two-way, uh, it, 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 it's a matrix of information flows trying to, trying to ensure that we are capturing and acknowledging uh, what's concerning people, what matters to people and how we're addressing and supporting and facilitating uh, that locally led, that locally derived uh, recovery need uh, and operation. So uh, absolutely, there are uh, there are arrangements in place that's ensuring uh, we are we have we have the equivalency of uh, coordination uh, and control arrangements uh, around around uh, programs, activities, support. As someone who was close to the fires, what I found really challenging was um, with the unprecedented firefighting event, we've seen unprecedented announcements and commitments to support, uh, whether it's financial support, uh, support programs around care and, and attention uh, or delivery of, of services into the field. And as someone that was close to it, I lost track of all the support that was available to individuals, to business, to, uh, to primary industry, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as someone who's close to it and not traumatised by the loss of everything uh, I've ever had, if I'm struggling to get my head around all those suite of support measures, then how does the poor person uh, in the field who's traumatised uh, even begin to contemplate um, um, what's available to them and how they access it? So there are certainly some lessons coming out of it. There is cohesion being managed through, through formal structures of coordination. And only in the last few weeks, we've already started talking about how do we evolve the unprecedented uh, operational arrangements for managing uh, information and recovery and rebuilding efforts uh, into broadening that work because the other suite of measures and programs that have been announced to support COVID recovery and re-energising and restarting social cohesion, wellbeing uh, and the economy, pulling all that together to ensure uh, that governments, uh, agencies right across New South Wales, uh, right throughout all our local areas, uh, communities at the local area, as well as our partners in the Commonwealth, we've got to make sure that we're pulling all that together to help the people out on the front line and adopting new programs of outreach and support and, and follow-up connectedness and, and making sure we, I think we've got just under 10,000 people that are registered uh, through the bushfire program for assistance and growing that connection and following up that connection and just making sure uh, that, that what their, their circumstances are being addressed and what support and assistance measures available are being afforded to them. So, so the commission, communications challenge is a real one. We've set up a one-stop shop through, through um, um, Service New South Wales uh, with a call line. We've got case management services. Uh, we've, got, we've got the ability to link with people directly. And we're also following up because everyone's circumstances are different. Uh, we've got the equivalent of case managers 
to save to save you, Peter, ringing in and talking to three different people every time you ring in to talk about your situation. You've got a single point of contact who knows your circumstances, who knows where, where you were last um, um, uh, working and what's coming up next. So that's all focused design uh, to try and support and alleviate the stress and concern of those that are working through very, very difficult circumstances. Yeah, I saw some of that firsthand and it's incredibly important to do that stuff. Um, for the folks back home where the um, Shane's screen is popping small because he's got uh, limited bandwidth there, that's because they're directing their bandwidth out to frontline services, of course, and uh, Shane's, in, Shane's uh, just sending out a small pipeline there. Shane, I know you're a humble man and humility is incredibly important when you get to the sort of level that you're in right now. Um, but I, I, I want to tease out, not really about you, but I want your thoughts on the relationship between communication and leadership. We've certainly seen a lot of positive comments um, about some of the leaders, particularly through the recent COVID situation. And without naming names, um, I think there's an important relationship between communications and leadership. I'd just like your thoughts on that. Oh, look, I would tend to agree with that, Peter. And <clears throat> uh, for me, I think, I think there are a number of core leadership traits that I think are important that I've always tried to ascribe to. And it, and it, it generally correlates then uh, to communications and how you communicate. So for me, uh, the, 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 the principles around leadership are certainly uh, authenticity. Uh, we need to be genuine and we need to be sincere. Uh, we need to be the real person. We, we cannot afford to be artificial or superficial. So authenticity is absolutely critical. Don't pretend to be something or somebody we're not. Uh, obviously, we strive to be a better person uh, and perform better. But authenticity is absolutely critical, understanding our weakness, understanding our strengths, uh, and working with the team around us to get the best possible results. So authenticity matters. Uh, I think the second thing is, um, it, is about, um, <clears throat> it is about humility and it is about empathy. Uh, so understanding that in leadership, it's not about you, it's actually about others. Uh, it's, about, it's about your customers, it's about the community of New South Wales, it's about those that are doing it hard. But it's also about your team, uh, uh, your teams and your, and your multifaceted teams that are working uh, as part of the broad effort to try and support and assist and, uh, um, uh, and improve the situation for others. So it's not about you, it's absolutely about others. Uh, the third thing is uh, taking decisions um, and, and, and making decisions and taking action is really, really important. Um, um, the, the pursuit of perfection uh, can often be um, the failure of delivery, uh, but also um, analysis uh, can often result in paralysis. So making decisions uh, with the information you've got available is really, really important, particularly in times of crisis, and particularly when people are desperately needing and wanting assistance. Uh, by all means, change that decision or adjust that action later on when the circumstances change or your information changes, uh, but, but for goodness sake, make a decision. Research shows over and over again, people are happier with a decision they don't like than no decision at all. Uh, and particularly if you explain why you're taking that decision with the information available at the time. I think mutual respect uh, is the other characteristic, uh, which is really, really important. Uh, understanding diversity of opinion, diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds and, and all sorts of circumstances that come together to pull together that team, uh, best actions, best decisions, uh, best strategy, best performance comes uh, when we've got respect for others, when we've got respect uh, for those that need assistance and for those that are providing assistance. So mutual respect, prosecuting arguments, doing it politely, as, as my mother always uh, taught my sisters and I, manners cost you nothing, but the lack of them can cost you everything. And that is fundamentally critical in communications. And, and if we translate that uh, from manners into respect, it is, abs it is absolutely about being respectful uh, in, in all that we're trying to do when it comes to communicating and, and prosecuting our case. And then I would underpin all those uh, uh, four or five leadership characteristics with the word care, uh, C-A-R-E. Um, uh, we need to care about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And, and if you genuinely care um, about what it is you're doing, then when it comes to communicating, the authenticity will shine through. Uh, they will see and, and appreciate uh, empathy and humility. Uh, they will understand that the decisions you're taking and the actions that you're taking are underpinned uh, by the care, the care for your teams, the care for your customers, and the care for those that are, that are in harm's way. 
Uh, and also, obviously, if you genuinely care about others and you care about your team and you care about those that you're trying to support and assist, then that'll come through in the way you're communicating in a respectful, courteous and polite manner. Uh, uh, manner. Uh, um, uh, you, you might need to be authority at times, uh, but you've got to deliver the message uh, knowing, uh, with people knowing that you care about their circumstances, you can, can care about their situation, and you care about providing the solutions to support them. Thanks, Shane. Great thoughts, unsurprisingly. Um, the other, uh, I guess, the other ridiculously huge challenge they've uh, put into your intray is building resilience for New South Wales. So, not just, you know, you've got this massive recovery operation that's underway and has been for well over a year now. Um, you've now got to start building resilience at the back of that. How do you see the communication role fitting into building resilience in that? Well, it is interesting, Peter, and it's going to be a challenge because um, we talk about resilience often and resilience at a, at a personal level, a family level, a business level, a community level, um, at a government level. But what we saw during these extraordinary uh, disasters and events is that for many of us, have we really thought about what resilience actually means? And, and, and the classic example I go to is, is the, the loss of power uh, results in, in such dislocation, uh, results in such inconvenience and disruption uh, to people's ability to operate and function. And, and whether it's anything from uh, power that feeds communications devices uh, and then stymies our ability to, to receive or make phone calls or access data services, or examples we saw down the south coast where, where we, we were looking at moving lots of holiday makers who needed to fuel their vehicles, but the service stations uh, had no fuel, uh, no, no power in the towns. There was plenty of fuel in the ground, but they couldn't operate the bowsers or the pumps to pump the fuel out. And even if they could operate the, uh, the bowsers to pump the fuel out, uh, then, uh, then no one could pay for anything because the FPOS machines were down and the power couldn't operate. So, so how resilient are we is the question we've got to ask ourselves. How prepared are we uh, for disruption or inconvenience or emergencies or disasters uh, to, to operate, uh, to disrupt what we take uh, for granted in the, in the way we operate every day? So, so what I've, what I've um, um, observed in my, in my time already with Resilience New South Wales is we've got a team of very dedicated and passionate people uh, that reach out all the time across New South Wales with local governments, with local communities having the conversation about what resilience means. And, and really at the end of the day, and I've already had some really good conversations uh, with, with government departments, but also uh, local government across New South Wales and, and collections of local government. And, and we are looking at new methodologies going forward about understanding and undertaking uh, resilience assessments across local areas. And, and what does that mean? Well, it's, 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 it's a broader risk assessment across our community to start thinking about where we are, what we need to do, how we, how we need to prepare ourselves for anything from social or demographic changes, infrastructure investment, uh, natural disasters, human-induced disasters, uh, whether they be storms, floods, bushfires, droughts, uh, or indeed cyber security attacks. How vulnerable are we? Uh, what's our exposure? And what can we do about it now to start building that resilience, to start mitigating against or preventing uh, the implications of those sorts of disruptions, um, whether, they're, whether they're emergency disruptions or whether they're whether there are events that grow, such as population trends or, or changes in demographics in our local area. So there's a significant conversation to be had right across New South Wales communities, but most importantly, trying to, trying to establish uh, capturing that information, capturing that conversation uh, and understanding what we can do now with decisions, with investment, with strategy, uh, with betterment, with improvement, to help us withstand the impact of disruption and disasters and emergencies, and most importantly, bounce back and recover as quickly as we possibly can following those disruptions. So a significant conversation piece, but in my, in my four weeks in this new role, there is absolutely universal, no matter where I go, people are ready for the conversation, people are wanting to ensure that we're, we're all on the same page, that we're working together, that we're supporting each other uh, in, in building resilience, uh, at a personal level, at a community level, uh, at a government, industry and business level uh, to ensure uh, that we can withstand disruptions, we can withstand emergencies to the best of our ability and most importantly, uh, bounce back and recover uh, as soon as possible after those disruptions. Yeah, thanks Shane. I, I, think, um, I think we all accept that it's got to be done at every single level 
And even if we, you know, if we're smart enough to have a seatbelt cover and a torch in our car, um, we, we need to, you know, be assured the government's on top of that as well, which is fantastic. Um, one of the story, I'm getting a lot of questions in from our, our audience. One of the questions here is about the, um, the moment, that incredibly moving moment, that the billboard in Times Square flashed up a thank you to the firefighters. Um, can you briefly touch on how that came about and what was the, what was the yeah, process in that? Absolutely. So um, our comms team back in the Rural Fire Service uh, made contact uh, with, the, with the team in Times Square and we partnered, uh, and I can't remember the name of the organisation right now, my team will not be very happy with me, but uh, to, to be offered uh, something like Times Square was, uh, was unheard of before and, and simply not within our normal remit. But to take that opportunity to see, to see the extent of the disasters and how it reached a global audience, um, as I said before, the worst, of, the worst of disaster, the worst of tragedy um, uh, resulted in, in the very best in humanity. And there was an outpouring of love and support and care not just across New South Wales and across Australia, but right around the world. And, and that, that tribute, uh, that space in Times Square was very symbolic of all that love, care and support that was coming from right around the, right around the globe uh, and, to, and, to, and to feature in, a, in, in such a significant place like that with such prominence uh, was, was very symbolic, very moving uh, and very special. Yeah, powerful indeed, it was. Um, we've only got a couple more minutes, but um, Catherine has asked about um, resilience being about self-care, and how do you how do you have that level of care when others non-stop during disasters without wearing yourself out emotionally? How do you maintain that rate of effort of self-care during the extraordinary? I mean, to say unprecedented is becoming cliche these days, but the extraordinary situations we've had over the last twelve months. Oh look, and, and and it's a really good it's a really good question, and I think the honest answer is uh, we probably don't uh, do it enough uh, for ourselves. Um, uh, for me, I know that I know that the big focus and the big the big benefit uh, was was working with colleagues, working with the team, sharing thoughts and feelings, um, looking out for each other, but also leveraging uh, family and loved ones at home. Um, the reality is uh, sometimes, though, uh, the, the nature of the operation, the nature of the campaign uh, commands a lot of attention, a lot of time, uh, limited sleep, uh, and we were all in that boat together. But, but I think together, uh, co contrasting to when I joined the organisation, you know, 30 odd years ago, um, we didn't talk as openly as we do today about our own emotional and psychological wellbeing. We didn't share thoughts and feelings the way we do today. And I think it's incumbent on all of us as leaders, uh, all of us as members of, of, of um, emergency service organisations, policing, fire and emergency services, that we openly have those conversations. Uh, we own the fact that it's okay not to be okay. We are all human at the end of the day uh, and we need to look out for each other. We need to look out for ourselves and help, our, help each other through uh, these difficult times, like we are focused on helping the community. Uh, we've got to be focused on, on looking after ourselves and our mates. Uh, and importantly, as you've said, Peter, uh, every now and then look at the person in the mirror and make sure you're asking them the question, are they okay? Uh, and listen to the answer coming back because uh, often we're not, often we are struggling, uh, but we know we've got a job to do. Uh, but together, uh, by looking out for each other, it helps us get through those difficult times.